Yoga teachers, are you wanting to sequence a yoga class around one particular pose, but you're struggling to understand how do you get there safely and effectively while still giving your students a beautiful, mindful and meditative practice? Welcome friends, my name is Kirsten. If you haven't come to my channel before, I create yoga flows to help you start practicing yoga and tips for yoga teachers. And today I will be giving you my top 10 simple steps towards peak pose sequencing. Now, instead of you having to frantically write down lots of notes as I'm speaking and I talk pretty fast, I have created a clear PDF sheet with all of the steps written down for you. So you can download that for free by clicking the link in the description below. Now, before we dive in, if you could give this video a thumbs up, a like, or subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, that's a fantastic way to support me so I can keep creating content for you. All right, now let's get into it. It. Now, step number one, select your peak pose. Now, depending if your class is for beginners or for advanced practitioners, that will of course determine which pose you choose. For example, if you were teaching a beginner's practice, you probably wouldn't choose Ekapada Galavasana flying pigeon pose as your peak because most likely most of the students won't be able to get to variation one or two or, or any of the modifications. So you might leave them feeling frustrated and disempowered, which is not what you want in your class. So instead, if you were teaching a beginner's practice, maybe the peak pose would be half moon, or maybe the peak pose would even be warrior two. Now also the pose that you pick, you wanna be fairly familiar with. So if you haven't been practicing it in your own personal practice, then I wouldn't choose it. You want to pick a pose that you know like the back of your hand. Whether you can get to the pose or not, it doesn't really matter, but you've been practicing it. You know all of the little subtle cues. You know how to workshop the pose in order to move towards it. Now, once you're happy with the pose that you've picked, we'll move on to step number two, which is understanding the benefits physically and energetically of the pose. Understanding the benefits of the pose will help you when you're choosing your language around the pose, when you're choosing what time of day to teach this practice, when you're choosing your theme and your intention for the class. For example, if you're choosing wheel as your peak pose, the benefits physically of wheel is that it's a big back bend. You're opening up the front line of the body. It's quite an energizing pose. And energetically, it's a heart opener, the sense of expanding out and opening up. It's a very stimulating pose. So with that knowledge, if I know that I'm gonna be teaching a peak pose like wheel, I probably would be teaching that class more in the mornings, at the start of the day when everything needs to be opened up and expanded out, rather than teaching that practice at the end of the day when your students probably need a little bit more grounding and calming of the nervous system before they head to sleep. Now within this step, it's also good to know what are the contraindications of this pose. For example, if a student had a wrist injury, shoulder injury, or was pregnant, what modifications would you offer them? And if you're doing a private just for them, would you be teaching this pose? For example, if I had a private client and they had a wrist injury and we were moving towards the peak pose, Bakasana Pro pose, I would probably change the practice to something like maybe a pincher practice where they're on their forearms. Or if you're teaching a public class and you're moving towards the peak pose of dragonfly, which is a deep twist and an arm balance, and you have a pregnant woman in her second trimester in the space, then you would need to know what modifications to give to her. So it's just good to remember what the contraindications are for each pose that you choose. Now, number three, what needs to be opened and what needs to be straight strengthened in order to get to this pose. Now listen up, this is probably the most important step of the 10. So when you're looking at the pose, what parts of the body need to be opened in order to come into the shape and what parts of the body need to be strengthened in order to find the alignment and the ability to hold the shape. So for example, if my pose is Pinchamayarasana forearm balance, 
I know that my shoulders need to be really opened. Possibly my hamstrings need to be opened in order to step into the pose and triceps need to be opened as well. In terms of what needs to be strengthened, there's lots of strength that's required for this pose. So the shoulders, the whole shoulder girdle, the arms, the forearms, the biceps, the triceps, the hands, the base knuckles, the abdominals need to be strong, the legs need to be strong, the glutes need to be strong to hold the shape. Step number four and five. Make a list of all the poses for opening and all the poses for strengthening. So if we're still moving towards pincher, I would write down all of the poses that would open my shoulders, my triceps, and my hamstrings. Then I would write down a list of poses that would strengthen my abdominals, my shoulders, my whole shoulder girdle, my glutes, my legs, my hamstrings, my feet. Lots of poses to choose from with that. So I'll work with you on this one. So if it's pincher for opening, I would write down poses like Anahatasana, Uttanasana, heart opener on the blocks, half Hanuman, standing splits, any tricep stretches, anything with the arms overhead, maybe elbows on the two blocks. For strengthening, I would pick dolphin pose, forearm plank, three-legged dog, warrior three. I would definitely look at the peak pose shape and think what would the modifications be for this? So for example, it would be dolphin pose. Then I would know, okay, I'm definitely gonna put dolphin pose in because that's actually a pose that has as a mixture of the two, opening and strengthening. Step number six is place the poses in order of intensity. You would then look at your two lists and start to put the poses in order of intensity. So for example, you would make another list for opening, putting the more gentle warm up opening poses at the start and putting the more intense opening poses at the bottom. So for example, I would probably put Anahatasana puppy pose more at the start in the warm up, and I would put dolphin pose or standing splits a little bit further down the list as it's more of an intense pose for your students. You wanna make sure that they're pretty warm before they come into those poses. Then you do the same for your list of strengthening poses. Out of these poses, what is more gentle, what is more of a warm up, and what is more of an intense pose that you would have later on in the practice. So you might put in a forearm plank on the knees right at the start of the practice and give the option to pick the knees off the mat. And then same as the opening, you might put your dolphin pose further down the list. Poses like warrior three would probably be further down the list then right in the warm up straight away, everyone's into warrior three. Now, before we move on to the next step, let me stop you here. If you are feeling at all confused or feeling like you need extra support as I'm talking through the steps and you wanna just speak directly to me through the camera, you wanna ask me those questions, then you might be interested in my eight week yoga teacher mentoring program. This is a one-to-one -one online program where you'll have a Zoom meeting with me every week where we'll go through all of the practical aspects of teaching as well as how to teach philosophy and each week will be individualized to your needs. Now the program will be open in a couple weeks and I only have eight spots available so if you're wanting one of those spots or if you're wanting to be on the wait list for the next program then please click the link in the description below. All right let's get back to the steps. Number seven create a warm-up from the two lists of opening and strengthening. So when you put them in order of intensity you would look at all of the poses that you put at the start that were more gentle, more of a warm up, and you would mix them together. So in my warm up, I would know for Pincha, I want to put in a puppy pose, maybe right at the start. Then I would transition to a forearm plank, supported, and then lead maybe to picking the knees off the mat. I would weave in a half Hanuman for opening and possibly a little bit more core work on the back. I would maybe do a low lunge while containing the low belly, still working on that containment as I open up my shoulders. Here I would really start to think about what is the shape that I'm creating for the peak? How do I already implement that into the warm up? So if the shape is arms overhead with the elbows bent, then I'm gonna put in shapes like this in the warm up. Step number eight, now you're building from your 
warm up. So you're looking at your list again of what you've done for opening and what you've done for strengthening. And we start to put together a middle one and middle two part of the practice. So if we're thinking about the different stages of your yoga class, there's the opening where you're grounding your students, that's where you put in your meditation, your pranayam, that's where you start to weave in your intention, your theme. Then you'd have your warm up, and towards the end of the warm up, you would put in your sun salute. Then you'd build from there. I call this middle one. This is now where you're at the middle part, the bulk of your class, where you're picking up the pace a little bit more. You're building heat in the body to move towards the peak pose. So when we're thinking about our middle one and middle two sections, you're looking at your list of poses once again, and you're looking at the poses that are more intense and you're creating a flow that builds, that has a progression. So for example, in middle one, I would put half Hanuman, I would put my first dolphin pose. And then in middle two, I would then build on that. Instead of half Hanuman, I might do standing splits. For warrior three, I might do it with hands at prayer or arms overhead to make it a little bit spicier as an option. I would build on my dolphin pose and do leg lifts. So one leg goes up in dolphin pose and then you lower down and then switch sides. So you're building from your middle one sequence and increasing the intensity for your middle two, which then will lead you nicely to workshop your peak pose. Step number nine, the peak. This is the moment that we've all been waiting for. This is where you're gonna workshop the pose. So you are showing the progression to the pose. You're showing all of the modifications towards the pose. So you really want to break this pose down and you want to make sure that you give yourself about five minutes to really workshop the pose. So I usually get all the students to drop their knees down, quickly look at me while I demonstrate and I show the different stages of the pose. So I clearly demonstrate to the whole room the different stages towards the peak and where they could go and what the student can choose depending on how they're feeling or where they're at in their practice. This will leave the students feeling more empowered because they have a choice. They can choose to take child's pose or they can choose to do these different variations of the pose, these different modifications. That way everyone is included. No one is sitting around just staring at the ceiling. Now I'm going slightly off topic here into more practical teaching skills, but you do want to be thinking about specific cues that you're going to give as you break down the pose for your students and then see if you can actually implement those cues at the start of practice so that they remember, oh yeah, she mentioned about the toes pointing down and the thighs spinning in, in this more of a warm-up pose. I'm gonna keep implementing that cue in throughout my practice and I'm gonna remember now to do that when I go into the peak. Now the last step is counter posing and the cool down. So now you wanna think of at least three or four poses to counter the shape that you just made with your peak pose. So for example, with Pincha, after all of this hugging in and rounding, I might choose to counter the shape by coming into broken wing, a shoulder opener lying on my belly. With counter posing, you also wanna think what parts of the body have I ignored in this practice or not really tended to. So with the Pincha class, I would probably do a hip opener as we haven't done much hip opening throughout the whole sequence. I would choose a hip opener that's cooling as we're bringing the class down towards Shavasana. So maybe pigeon pose on their back. Again, remember you wanna give students plenty of time to cool down so they're not buzzing after class, buzzing during Shavasana. You really want them to be grounded and calm as they process the whole practice in their Shavasana, in their stillness. Our intention is to leave the students feeling balanced, like they've had still a fairly well-rounded practice, even though they've been working towards a particular peak pose. So there we have it, folks. That was my top 10 steps to peak pose sequencing. Now, again, if you are at all unsure of any of the steps and you feel you need that extra support or 
Now that you've listened to me, you kind of like me as a person and you want to have that one-to-one -one coaching with me, then please click the link below for the eight-week yoga teacher mentorship program. And if you're interested how I became a yoga teacher and my yoga journey, then watch this video next. Thank you so much for watching guys. Until next time, namaste.